The Simon Filer Podcast, giving authors a platform. Welcome. Welcome to the podcast. Well, it has been a fabulous week working with the vivacious, intelligent, determined and knowledgeable data queen, Dr. Selena Fisk. When Selena contacted me about making her audiobook dream a reality with I'm not a numbers person, I was thinking, <laughs> I'm definitely going to learn something here. <laughs> That's me. And here we are. We've just wrapped up the recording and many thanks to Dr. Fisk for hanging around doing the podcast with me. Uh, welcome, Selena. Thanks, Simon. Um, I hope that you weren't bored. <laughs> that was my number one concern, that you were going to be bored listening to a whole book on numbers. <laughs> we'll get to that later. <laughs> we'll sure. get to that later. So firstly, what are your thoughts now you've completed your first audiobook narration? Um, my voice is sore. That's one thing I'm thinking about. But it was actually really... It was a really great process actually to go through um, both, I guess, to experience what people do when they record audiobooks. Um, I am often critical of people who don't narrate their own books when I buy them and listen to business books. Mm. Um, and so now I probably have a greater appreciation for the amount of time and effort that it takes to actually do that well. Um, but one of my favorite authors, interestingly, went back recently and re-recorded one of her books because it had been narrated by someone else and people oh. weren't happy with it. So um, I was really glad she did that, but didn't think too much of it. So um, Have you yeah. listened to her version of it? Uh, not yet. I've listened to a whole lot of her other stuff and yeah, I just love it. And she presents really, really well. So I, it kind of made sense that the listeners were like, we want you, we want your voice to yeah. be narrating this. So um, yeah, no, great process. Um, awesome. Really interesting and lots of fun. Very yeah. chill as well. I was worried about, I was being, I was really stressed about it and thinking, am I going to get it right? What if I make mistakes? But it's actually not a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> Let it smooth. Sweet. Yeah. Well, that's one of my things I say, you know, like with regards to self-narrating it, it's like you wrote that story, you know it best, and it just enhances your legacy, you know what I mean? Not only your words, but now your voice. So I always like try and not, I'm not going to say push, but coerce the authors into doing it themselves. Yeah. But you do a lot of public speaking. How did recording your audio book sort of differ from live presentations? Um, I'd like to think that the fact that I speak professionally has helped me do it. I think also the fact that I was a teacher for so long and I had to make things exciting and interesting to kids, um, particularly 15 year old boys, certainly helped the process. <laughs> that can't be easy. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> trying to convince them that maths matters. Um, yeah, it was a bit tricky. Uh, it definitely takes more energy though. I think a three hour session with you, you know, I'm usually pretty cooked after a half day workshop with people where I'm presenting. But I also, when I'm keynoting or talking to large groups, I always pause every kind of 20 minutes or so and give participants the opportunity to think about the content, think about how it applies to them and spend a bit of time talking to the people around them. So um, yeah, certainly set me up and helped me with the process. But at the same time, just that back-to-back -back recording was definitely something I wasn't used to yeah it's it's grueling mm. yeah definitely with high concentration obviously you're looking at that, those words and they're yep. sort of jumping out all over the place by the end of the three hours yep absolutely <laughs> but you certainly turned your hand really wonderfully to it like i think you you know your inflections and your delivery were really engaging as people are going to hear when they listen to the book so i'm not a numbers person it explains data the need to understand it and use it to be competitive in today's world. That's actually what it meant back in my day before the internet, yeah. <laughs> collecting facts and statistics for reference or for analysis. But for the purpose of this chat, I think we also need to clarify that the difference between the data that you're talking about in your book is not quite the same as the data that runs out on my girl's phones, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Why do you think they call that data? Yeah, it, it that certainly is data. It's just, um, yeah, it's used in a different way, right? It just has a different meaning. And essentially the term of, you know, like your phone plan allows 10 gig of data downloads. Um, you know, it's a measure of the amount of the information that's coming down or being uploaded at any given time. So um, yeah, same, same, but different really. Mm, interesting. I knew you'd have an answer <laughs> for that. So how and why did you get into the world of data? What was that all about? Yeah, so I started out as a maths and PE teacher, actually. So former life feels like forever ago, but I used to actually be a head of phys ed in a school, right. um, which, yeah, totally different to what I'm doing now, obviously. Mm. Um, but when I, I went to the UK and I was teaching in the UK and there's it was a really negative data-driven culture over there. So I went in 
very clear pass rates for my previous senior subjects. There were very clear expectations on me to increase the pass rate to so some of those KPIs that I talk about in my book. And there was a really, um, yeah, high expectations, but at the same time, really poor use of data. Uh, it was really used to hold people accountable and really negative, and there was complete burnout in people. And, you know, I mean, we were essentially, our performance was essentially measured by our performance in one metric at the end of a 12 month period. And it was, you either got there or you didn't, and you were in a lot of trouble and performance managed if you didn't hit it. So I had done that in the UK and then came back to Australia and came back into a context where in the school that I went back into, there was no data whatsoever. And so there was kind of this gap and I was like, mm. despite the really bad stuff in the UK, I'd seen some real positives in my own practice and I'd started using it more and being curious with it and trying new things out. So when I came home, I was like, I just reckon there's a huge gap here. Mm. Um, and that was why I started my doctorate, actually. So that took about seven years of writing my doctorate around students and their use of data and wow. perceptions of feedback. When um, was that that you got back? Oh, it was a long time ago. It was 2010. Okay. So these practices were in place in like 2007 onwards, even before that in the UK. Feels like a long time ago yeah. now. Um, we're only really catching up now or? Yeah, <laughs> I mean. I mean, a, I mean, I'm only just catching no, up. No, no, absolutely. Um, there's been, and, and I hope that schools, for example, don't ever get to that point that they're at in the UK um, because they completely remove the human from it. But yeah, they were a long way ahead um, mm. in that respect, whether it's good or bad, I guess. You could look at it in, in both ways. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I started my doctorate and then to be honest, the first book I wrote, so I, before this book, I wrote two books for schools. Um, and this is the first for like a corporate, um, or business audience. And I basically was just writing books while I was still teaching full time. And I was doing a bit of presenting and keynotes on the side. And then I just got to the point where I thought I'm going to give it a crack and see whether I can make, you know, a full-time gig out of being a data storyteller and, mm. and writing about data storytelling. So well, it certainly yeah. seems like you're making a little bit of headway there. Mm. Well, this audio book starts off with you and your mate, Michael, having the conversation about how he finds it relatively easy to correlate data for his finances. However, mm. every other type of data is like like Google Analytics in particular, because that scares me to yeah, death as a well. Lot. And many other sort of analytics out there. Um, but he didn't really obviously know how to use that or what to do with it because there's so much of it. This conversation, was that what triggered maybe writing this book or how did you... Um, it was just a timely conversation. I think the book idea had always been in the back of my head. And the more I was obviously working in the data storytelling space in schools, I then was getting interest from outside schools and in corporate, and I obviously recognise that the the ideas are exactly the same, regardless of the data mm. that you have or that you use. Um, so yeah, it was just a really timely conversation where I had told him I was writing the book, and then he kind of said, well, this is what I think about that. Um, and then it was kind of nice because that was an authentic loop back in the conclusion of the book where I was still writing it at this point. I was a long way through the manuscript. And then he sent me an email saying, this is what I'm talking about as the subject line. And he just got this email from Google and it was like, do you want us to add all of these things to your ad? And he just said, I have no idea what any of these things mean. And he's a really, you know, he's like a tech head. He loves IT. He's a photographer. He's a coder. Um, but when wow. it came to advertising on Google, he's like, I have no idea what these metrics are. Um, so yeah, it's a real challenge. Yeah, well, I th think that your book will help a lot of people, laymen as well, lay people mm -hmm. as well, because all of those analytics scare me going into even Instagram or any of yeah. those like X. Yeah. <laughs> but they help all sorts of businesses. And I mean, obviously, we've just been through your whole book and they are the way forward, because mm. if you don't get to know them, your business is probably maybe not going to succeed or... Well, yeah, it, it's also like... I guess what you value, right? You know, for me on my socials, the things I value is the number of people that are connecting with me on LinkedIn. It's the number of post impressions that I have. Um, there are tons of other metrics, but for me, those are kind of my two KPIs for my social media presence. And they're just the things that matter to me. Um, but somebody like me or for you, you know, for example, could have totally different metrics that you value. 
and neither's right or wrong but it's about having a good enough understanding of what is available and what's out there so you can make those decisions about actually this is something I'm going to keep a track of. Yeah well that kind of brings me to the question of what actually is data there's so many different forms of it. Yeah absolutely um, in the book I talk about qualitative and quantitative and you know we want to be triangulating information right so when we triangulate data we're drawing information from three or more sets of information and you know there's certainly an assumption that that always has to be quantitative information like numbers but it also doesn't have to be there's a lot of other qualitative information you know like even you think about quantitative engagements in a post on socials might be the number of comments or the number of likes or the number of impressions qualitatively you might have some really great engagement in the comments and so the depth of reflection and commentary and questioning and the back and forth of people that might actually be far more useful and valuable to you and that's still a data source but it's qualitative information because it's you reading through the comments and kind of going yeah that's actually really good engagement and that's the stuff that matters to me rather than the fact that you know 20 people have commented and all they've done is tag a mate yeah um totally different yeah well some people might even you know be more excited by the fact that two people wrote really good comments on there whatever it is rather than like they only got three people that liked it yeah <laughs> it's two people commented yep. yeah yeah absolutely and would that then drive you to think well maybe the comments are the things that I should be taking on board rather than how many people are liking it yeah again it depends what you value you know in my world putting out information on socials that hopefully helps the audience is what matters to me so good quality engagement where people are really being reflective they're bouncing ideas off each other like that's absolute gold for me you know whereas if you were trying to sell something that's kind of not the type of engagement that you're seeking necessarily so again it's kind of, this is where it's really frustrating yeah. and hard there's no right or wrong answer yeah um, it very much depends but it's having the confidence to be able to bounce between them mm. well you definitely dive very deep into the world of data uh, Sorry about that. <laughs> I'm not a numbers person discussing quantitative and qualitative data amongst many other types yeah. of data, like you just cry triangulation and whatever. Um, for me, it was really daunting. Triangulation <laughs> and whatever. <laughs> I love it. Triage. <laughs> yeah. yeah. For me, it was really daunting, actually, or quite daunting, I was saying in my question here to get my head around, because um, as I said at the beginning, I'm not a numbers person. In fact, he did ask me, he said, how bored were you? Yeah. Why did you ask me? <laughs> Oh, no. I wasn't sleeping. No, no, no. It definitely it was not your demeanor at all. You were. Can you still tell? <laughs> yeah. People who are listening keep persisting with Simone because she is like the utmost professional. Oh, she was awake at all times. <laughs> um, no, because there is certainly a perception like it. Um, you know, the, na the reason I named the book I'm Not a Numbers Person is because literally that's what people say to me all the time. And for a lot of people, they formulate almost this idea of they are or they're not a numbers person when they're going through school. And often it's that transition from primary into secondary school where people just start to identify as either being good at maths or not. And there's a whole piece around whether or not it's cool to be good at maths or into maths. Um, that's you were a, speaking my subject, seriously. Yeah, I always yeah. think I just, I was never any good at maths. But it's it's not as simple as you can or you can't do it, right? It is a continuum. And as I say in the book, people move up and down that continuum the more they practice. And then if they stop or they go into a role where they're not using a lot of numbers or data, they forget stuff and then they have to loop back and refresh and relearn it down the track. So yeah, I just don't think it's ever as simple as you can or you can't do numbers. Mm, yeah. I reckon we all can. Yeah. I think I learned a lot even, you know, by that one listen. I'm editing it, so I'll have another <laughs> couple of I might be an expert yeah. by the time I hand it out to Audible. <laughs> yeah. Um, why do you reckon that being data aware is an advantage of a successful business? Because you do mention that in your book that, you know, successful businesses are really kind of looking into the data. Mm. Yeah, it's about being reflective and responsive to what's going on around you. You know, um, I've worked with people and I've met people who've almost proudly said to me, yeah, well, Selena, I've done this for 20 years. It's worked for me for this long. Why would I change? Um, our entire world is changing at a remarkable rate. You know, people change, our context change, the world changes. And um, data can be a really powerful way of showing us what's landing with people, what's working, what's not working. Um, and then it allows us to think about, well, so what? What do I do with that information now that I have it? So, and it's way better than just trusting your gut um, or your hunch because, you know, in the book we talk about 
some of those different biases that impact our thinking about data. And, you know, at the end of the day, we can jump to conclusions about what we think is happening in a company or in life or in our finances. But data, particularly quantitative data, is more objective. Um, It can just give us better information, to be honest, um, than just our hunch or our gut, because our hunch and our gut are influenced by all of those cognitive biases plus more um, that sit behind all of that. So, yeah, it can just really help us understand and have a better understanding of what's going on in the company. Mm. The growth throughout your book is epic, going from firstly knowing numbers, Mm. Michael and and co, to understanding data and then being actually able to explain the data, Mm. essentially becoming a data storyteller and building the data storytelling like you would a story. It's like, where are we going? We started out doing numbers here and now we are writing a story. Yeah, it's it's about the numbers, but it's actually not about the numbers, right? (laughs) How did that concept, where did that come from? It's like, how did you... Yeah, it's... um, um, it's what a phrase. The heck? Yeah, <laughs> data storytelling. It's a cool phrase. Um, and I, to be honest, when I first started doing this work in 2017, 2018, I used to always talk about trends and actions, trends and actions all the time. And then um, I don't actually even remember what I was reading. And I read this phrase, data storytelling, and it was a bit of a description about what it was. And it was a huge light bulb moment for me. And it was that, for me, that real merger between you know, the narrative and the human beings that are generating the data and being impacted by the decisions we make and the data itself, whether that's quantitative or qualitative. So, um, yeah, I don't know where I heard it, but it's been a real game changer for me. Mm. Um, and then I just a few years ago when I was trying to describe myself on LinkedIn and, you know, as I was making a bit of a go at it as a, um, a self-employed person, I thought, no, I am a data storyteller. I'm just going to own it and name it. And um, I looked on LinkedIn at the time and there was nobody saying that they were wow. a data storyteller. And I was like, Innovator. I actually don't care. I'm just going to give this a crack and see what happens. Um, and now it makes me really happy to see that other people are kind of identifying as that. And it's certainly becoming more of a thing um, because our data scientists and um, our analysts and our the people who are working in AI, we need all of that brain power and intelligence doing that awesome work. And at the same time, if we can't communicate those insights to people that can do something about it, then it's all completely a waste of time, to be honest. Mm. So I think storytelling is that really nice merger of the narrative and the human um, with the data. Yeah. And I reckon a lot of people like myself who aren't numbers people can do with people like you. Absolutely. Absolutely actually explain that data to us yeah and you know like one of the things brent dyke says he says you know people remember stories they don't remember numbers and that's the thing right we remember those experiences and the connection to stories that people share and the number or the metric might be one small part of it but they if you remember it it's because of the story it's not because of the single number necessarily or it has to be a particularly shocking (laughs) um number for you to remember so um yeah, at all other times, we use narratives and stories to enhance um, the impact it has on people. You mentioned Brent just then, mm. and you got a really good um, review from Brent. How did that come about? How do you know him? Yeah, I totally fangirl over that man. So he <laughs> um, wrote the book Effective Data Storytelling about six years ago now, and um, he works in the US, and he does a lot of data storytelling work for like Sony and Amazon and Nike and some massive companies over there. Wow. And early on, he was actually employed full time while he was writing that book. And so I kind of first met him, if you like, over Zoom, but when he first kind of went out on his own um, in his own company and he'd released the book and I actually wanted to interview him for, I have an online course. And and so I actually wanted to interview him for that. And it was just the coolest thing because we just riffed for an hour. And some of the people who watched the video back are like, oh my God, you two are like (laughs) in nerd heaven together. (laughs) Um, and he, to be honest, he's just been a huge supporter of my work. He's just, you know, he's always kind of liking my stuff and he's being really supportive. And I just reached out to him with my manuscript and I was like, you know, if you don't ask, you you don't get. That's and I just right. thought, are you interested in potentially having a bit of a read and giving me feedback or writing a testimonial? And he was like, yeah, sweet. I'll have a read and write you a testimonial. So mm, nice um, one. yeah, I really, really appreciate it and value his um, perspective on it. Well, obviously you're doing a really good job of his doing so well and he's you know going to give you the review and riff with you for an hour on that (laughs) that's awesome so who did you did you have someone in mind when you were writing i'm not a numbers person yeah it's a good question um i've been asked on a couple of podcasts who the audience is and um (laughs) a couple of times i've said well i reckon anybody would benefit from it and i've actually had podcast guests come back and go don't say anybody let's re-record that (laughs) um 
I mean, <laughs> so, th- so I'm not going to say everyone, <laughs> but or and, whichever way you want to go. Um, look, I think if somebody was lacking confidence and needed to use data in their role, um, I reckon I'd like to think it's a pretty easy book to read. Um, I, I write I mean, plus minus editing and all that type of thing, but I largely write how I speak. Yeah. Um, I want it to be conversational. I don't want it to be like a maths textbook. Yeah. So I'd like to think that somebody who was struggling with numbers and knew that it was part of, say, their role or it was in their portfolio or they felt that they needed to get better at it, I would like to think that it would give them some ways of thinking about numbers, but also some strategies as to like what to do next and how to use that in their work. Um, in saying that, I also reckon there's... Um, you know, given that data storytelling is a relatively new concept uh, and hasn't been explored, there's actually not a lot of research around it. Um, How ironic. <laughs> yeah, the irony, right? Um, but that's the nature of academic research. It takes years for something to be embedded in organisations to then be researched, to then publish papers on it. So there's a lot of research currently happening, but it just hasn't been published yet. Um, so you're really at the cutting edge, aren't you? Oh, trying yes you, you know. are we'll see <laughs> see what happens might fall flat right um i reckon that also i'd like to think that if somebody was struggling with people in their teams and trying to build their understanding of data i'd like to think that it might be a useful read for them as a way of how do they shift their language their tone how do they talk about data how do they work out what to focus on so that they can hopefully bring other people along on the journey with them i yeah. definitely got that from the book yeah that's okay. what i thought yeah team leaders and and yeah. getting their team organized and getting their heads around it yeah so people who've got a bit of confidence but yeah they're also working on or working with other people in their skill as well yeah so you published through major street publishing how did you get involved with them have yeah. you published all books through them no i haven't so i've published four books i've actually had three different publishers um right. i because my other that's already a coup in itself you didn't have to self-publish mm. You know? Well, you my first do. book, I, it was just, um, you know, somebody said to me when I wrote my first one, and it was the school's book, but they kind of said, look, data's kind of in the zeitgeist at the moment, and I feel like I am just lucky that I'm riding that wave of it is what people want to know more about um, at the minute. So the first two books I published through one education publisher, and obviously because this book is a corporate and business audience, they were never going to publish. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not a numbers person. So... I'm in a business school, actually, and there was quite a few people from my business school who have published with Major Street, um, and they're based in Melbourne, and I met Leslie, um, and yeah, it's just been a really awesome process. Um, Leslie was amazing. So I initially met her, told her what my ideas were, and then she said, okay, I'm going to go away and do some research and come back. And we jumped on a Zoom, and um, she literally came back to me, and this was the irony, like she's a words person, and she came back and went, okay, we need to talk about the numbers because numbers books don't sell. And she was like, what, how do we do this? How do you market it? How do you get this to more readers? Um, You know, and basically I had to have a strategy for increasing the reach because traditionally this type of book is not flying off the shelves in the Mm. same way that say, um, you know, other books might. So um, yeah, I hope with the title that resonates with some people, but um, Yeah. yeah, it's obviously worked and here we are. Yeah. a year later and recording the audiobook so yeah fantastic well mm. i think the, obviously leslie and co do a great job i worked with mark berry yeah. as well and he spoke incredibly highly of them yeah they're really really good operators and yeah. super smooth process and it's actually been really nice so i used a different education publisher for my fourth book um but the editor and the designer were both exactly the same as major street so oh. they work quite closely together and so it's actually been nice even though it's a different publishing company to work with very similar people so yeah Yeah. it's been awesome so when you spoke with leslie about the um title of your book i'm not a numbers person did you guys have a discussion because it's kind of more about data you know i was thinking like the first but when you first got into it i was like yeah yeah but then i was like why not a data yeah it's probably just it was the phrase that really resonated with me and numbers are certainly obviously like we're saying it's a part of data but it's not everything but that's the thing that i you know you need a catchy title right and as i said people say that to me all the time so it was just um yeah it was just what i really wanted to go with and she agreed 
I so. think there's a definitely something in that because as soon as you guys contacted me, I was thinking mm. I'm not a numbers person. I knew I was going to learn something <laughs> <laughs> minimal, yeah. I think. But, yeah. you know, maybe after the next edit, like I said. But certainly there's probably a lot of people like me that are going to say, yeah, I'm not a numbers person mm. either. What's that about? Yeah. Um, and there's a bit of a – I reckon there's a bit of a trend at the moment with some books being like one word as the title and then they have a, a strap line that provides more information. Um but all of my books, I'm very clear in the title. Yeah. Um, and so I guess I just want the right people picking it up and thinking, yeah, this is the right book for me. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah. Mm. so what about you? Tell me a little bit more about you. You started out teaching and then you got here and you've done your doctorate. You've got your own business. Yep. Tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah. So um, I'm self-employed now and I still do a fair bit of work with schools, but um, lots with corporate. And I guess, you know, I was saying before, the thing I really started to see was that people beyond schools have the same challenges. And it has surprised me the more that I've done this work, how much sometimes it's people that you don't expect. Like I've worked with the health industry, people in the health industry who've really kind of been saying to me at an organizational level or at a team level, we don't know what data to focus on. Like I was like, hang on, but health professionals are really good with numbers. Yeah. <laughs> um, and what do you think? So especially after COVID, they were delivering absolutely. them on telly all the time. Right. <laughs> and really good with like personal health data, but obviously just not used to looking at that more strategic kind of team level data. Um, and visualizations. And then um, another one that's really surprised me was people in the real estate industry. Mm. So working with people who, you know, we talk about me median house prices and average house sale and you know, all that kind of thing. But at an, again, at an organizational or team level, it's just that oftentimes companies haven't had a chance to kind of zoom out and go, hang on, like, let's just take stock of what data do we have? What matters? What do we care about? What do we want people doing with it? Um, and how does that look for different groups of employees in our in our organization? And so now I get to do that. I get to work with schools and do some of that thinking with them and other organizations. Like I'm working with a group of CIOs at the moment, like chief information officers, which again, I would never have thought would have been a group of people that I would need to work with. But for them, it's through the lens of how do we actually communicate in a way that's going to help the other people in our organization use the data. So it's from a different, it's kind of a slightly different slant mm. from um, how I work with some other people, but yeah, really it's, interesting. I think you're paving the way for a whole new industry. Giving it a good crack. Look at you go. <laughs> Where can people contact you? Or find out more at the very least. Yeah, um, so my website is selenafisk.com. Um, but I'm, you know, as we've talked about, I'm pretty active on LinkedIn um, at Dr. Selena Fisk and on Twitter um, at Dr. Selena Fisk. You just get more dog pictures and videos on Twitter than you do on LinkedIn. So <laughs> whichever one works, really. Oh, bless. <laughs> um, well, it's been my pleasure working with you. I've learned a lot. You're such a fun girl. We had a few really good laughs, laughs there. Easy to work with. And man, this girl can read. Like you made oh minimal gosh. mistakes. Hey, I was very impressed. I didn't. <laughs> I'd make no mistakes and then five mistakes in the same sentence. So, you know, <laughs> on Selena average, was saying we I... talk about numbers, on average. <laughs> anyway. Selena was saying, I was doing so well and then I'd get in my own head. I'd yeah. get in my own head. And then I was like thinking about other things and there's still words coming out of my mouth. But anyway, clearly I can talk about this for days. So Awesome. Well, yeah. hopefully we'll have the book wrapped up, edited, and it'll be out within the next, I don't know, four to six weeks. Awesome. So people can look up I'm Not a Numbers Person by Dr. Selena Fisk. Thank cool. you so much for being part of my podcast today. Oh, thank you, Simon. It's been awesome. Thank you. Thanks for joining the Simon Filer Podcast. What's your story? Contact Simon for a chat at brisbaneaudiobookproduction.com.